Alright, so today I'm going to talk about building recommendation systems in Ruby. But first, you're probably wondering, like, who is this guy and what does he know about recommendation systems? Right, I'm far too young to have a PhD, so what gives me the authority to talk uh, to you guys about this subject? So I'm currently a data scientist at a startup in San Francisco called ShareThrough. We're a native advertising platform. So basically what we do is we take uh, brand content from throughout the web and we uh, promote it on other websites. The important thing there is that our goal is to make it feel native, which means it has to feel like content on that site, which means ultimately our ad targeting comes down to content recommendations. So a large part of my job is building content recommendation systems so that we can power the ads we hope to serve. So before I get going, I have to give you all a warning. There's going to be a little bit of math coming up. Uh, I know it's late in the day, so I try to keep it like as light as possible, but obviously recommendation systems is kind of a math-heavy subject, so we're going to have to look at a little bit of math. So my goal with this talk is basically to start off with just describing like what is a recommendation system, right? We have to understand what they are. And then I'm going to look at collaborative filtering based recommendation systems. Probably the most common thing, probably the word you've heard before. Then I'm going to move on to content based recommendation systems. And then finally we're going to look at uh, hybrid algorithms. So basically getting the best of both worlds by combining collaborative filtering and content based. Then I'm going to touch on how you evaluate recommendation systems. And then finally, I'm going to give you some resources and point out a couple of existing libraries so that if you want to learn more that I don't have enough time to cover, you can go on and find out more information on your own. So what this talk is not going to be, though, is it's not going to be everything there is to know about recommendation systems. Obviously, that's a very complex subject. There are tons of people doing PhDs on it. Companies employ de entire departments. My goal is really to give you an overview so you can have a good foundation in what's going on behind the scenes of these common algorithms so that you're you know enough to look further on your own and so that you don't have to view the whole thing as a big black box. And then obviously, as a result, it's not going to be bleeding edge machine learning, right? This is not the right audience for that. I like geeking out on that. You probably wouldn't care, probably find it a little bit boring. It's also not going to be how to use a specific library. I feel like it's really important when you're doing this kind of stuff to take that step uh, inside the library to understand what the algorithm really does, because otherwise you'll come to a point in time when you're using this library, it doesn't work, and you have absolutely no idea how to fix it and why it isn't working. So let's start off with what is a recommendation system? Right, so simply put, a recommendation system is a program that predicts a user's preferences about using information about other users, the user themselves, and the items in your system. Right, so these are prevalent throughout the web. Right, pretty much every big company is using them in every domain. One of the best examples in the social space is LinkedIn. Right, people you may know, organizations you might be interested in, all these things are recommendations. Netflix uh, ran a million dollar bounty for improving their recommendation systems. So you see it pretty much every time you log in. Top 10 movies they think you're most likely to like. Helps them drive engagement with their platform, keep users watching movies. If you guys like Spotify, they're also doing recommendations, right? Radio at its core is really just a recommendation product. What other songs are you likely to want to listen to based on the track you previously listened to? And finally, the most common is Amazon's customers who bought this item also bought, which clearly shows I read a lot of machine learning books. So you're probably wondering, right, how do I build one of these things, right? What is it really underneath the surface of all these products that we see every day? And it turns out there's really two main categories of algorithms that power most of these recommendation systems. And that, those are collaborative filtering based, oftentimes called nearest neighbor or neighborhood based algorithms and content-based algorithms, which are sometimes just called classification, because at the core, you're really just doing a classification task. So we're going to start out by looking at collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering is a way of filling in user, like missing user preferences based on similar users or similar items. Right? So if I haven't rated movie A, we can use information about other users to fill in my preference for movie A, or really infer my preference for movie A. And within collaborative filtering, there are really two types of collaborative filtering algorithms. There's so-called memory-based and model-based. So memory-based uses similarity metrics between users or items to infer these preferences. 
Uh, in this case, the data set is usually kept in memory. And then we have model-based. Model-based tends to be much more complicated and trains a classifier or a collaborative filtering algorithm off offline. And really what you're doing is you're generating an algorithm that kind of explains the underlying phenomenon to help fill in these blanks. I'm actually not going to talk about model-based algorithms today because they tend to be much more complicated. And unfortunately, Ruby at the moment doesn't really have the tools to do model-based algorithms in a 40-minute talk. So I'm going to talk about memory-based. Memory-based, the most common thing you'll hear is user-based collaborative filtering. Right? So user-based collaborative filtering kind of sounds scary, but when you break it down, it's actually really two very simple components. We have a user item, user item matrix and a similarity function. And using these two things, what we get back is the top k most similar users to the user you're interested in providing a recommendation for. So the first part of that, the user item matrix, is actually very simple. Right? Here's an example using videos. So we have five videos and five users. What we can see is just the way users have rated these videos. And basically, the goal of our collaborative filtering is to fill in the values for those two question marks. So now that we have that user item matrix, the next thing you're going to need to build one of these algorithms is you're going to need a similarity function. So a similarity function is what you're going to use to determine which users are like you or like the user you're trying to provide a recommendation for. And there are two really common similarity functions that you're likely to use and you're likely to hear about. The first one of those is uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is basically a way of doing similarity based on how correlated two users in your data set are. And the second one is uh, cosine similarity. Cosine similarity is based on the angle between two feature vectors. So let's take a look at Pearson's correlation coefficient, as this is the most prevalent algorithm and gets you the best results. So this is the formula for Pearson's correlation coefficient to calculate the similarity between user x and user y. And that looks a little bit scary, right? Like, that's a pretty big formula. There's a lot of kind of Greek letters going on there. There's like these bars on top of R's. Who knows what's going on? But it actually turns out that it's pretty simple. If we start to break it down, look at each of the individual components that make up the algorithm, and actually turn that into Ruby code. So the first thing we'll do is we'll look at that sigma notation, right? So we all know that that's a sum, which is a basic for loop. But the question is, what is it a sum over? Right, so we have basically, it's a sum of all elements with little i in the set of all items x, y. So if we break that down into Ruby code, it actually becomes much, much simpler. Right, really what you're trying to do is you're just trying to iterate over all the shared items that two users have. So you can see the Ruby code for that there is actually very simple, right? Shared items is just user 1's ratings, and then we reject ratings that aren't also in users 2 ratings. Because when we're trying to calculate correlation between users, we have no way of determining how closely related they are if they don't share those items. Because right? basically, in that case, there's just no way you can infer the correlation, because it'll be zero all the time. So we throw them out. And the next thing you'll see is that we automatically return zero if the users share no items. So if we're talking about a correlation, if two users have nothing in common, like clearly there's no correlation between them. Right? That's like saying there's a correlation between the color of the sky and uh, how tall I am. So the next thing we'll look at is let's attack the numerator of that equation. So again, it kind of looks a little bit scary, but when we break it down, we'll see it's actually much simpler. So if we pull that up and we start to look at the Ruby code, we'll see that what you're doing is you're basically taking averages and then subtracting each individual measurement that you observe from those averages. So the first thing we do is we calculate the average rating for user number one. That, again, is pretty simple Ruby code, right? We've all done that before. All you have to do is iterate over all the items for user one and its ratings, add them up, and then divide by the number. We do the same thing for user number two. Those two numbers actually give us what's called the Rx bar and uh, Ry bar, which is just fancy notation for the average rating for user x and user y. And then we move on to that second step, where for each, uh, each rating, we go through and we subtract the average rating, and that's what gives us the inside part of the parentheses for both items. Right? And that's, that's pretty simple Ruby. When we look at it, really, all this kind of complex math just translates down into a couple of different for loops where we're adding up different numbers. So now that we have the numerator tackled, we're going to look at the denominator. Right? The denominator looks actually very similar to the numerator, the only difference being you're actually squaring it. 
So we'll again look at the Ruby, and it turns out that's also really, really simple. Because we've already calculated that average, all we have to do again is iterate over the shared items, pulling out the ratings, and then squaring them. And then at the end, we do the square root, and that's all there is to it. So that kind of complex formula that we originally had for Pearson's correlation coefficient ends up translating down into something that we can implement in only 40 lines of Ruby code. Right, this is pretty cool because this is actually the core metric that powers a lot of the recommendations you still see every single day. So when, when you go on Amazon.com, you go on LinkedIn, they're actually using this Pearson correlation coefficient to power those recommendations you see every day. So now that we, have the, like, we know how to compute the similarity between two users, how do we actually take that and turn it into a recommendation? So just to refresh your memories, this is what our user video matrix that the example is going to be based on. So this is all the Ruby code it takes to take that matrix and actually convert it down into a recommendation. Right? So the first part of this code, I'm just taking that, uh, that matrix and turning it into something that Ruby knows how to process. In this case, I use hashes because it makes it the easiest for us to work with. And then it's really very simple. right? What we do is we take all users that aren't ourselves, and we calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient between the user that we're interested in providing a recommendation for and all the other users we know about. And then it's really very simple. So what we want is we want the top k users. In this case, k is 2. So now that we know the correlation between every single user, we know like user A and user B are correlated with, let's say, 0.5. And user A and user C are correlated with, let's say, 0.3. Right? All we're going to do is we're just going to take the top k users and we're going to pull them out. And that gives us a variable top k users. And then it's actually very, very simple. All we do is we take those top k users and we compute the average rating for all the videos that they've currently rated. And then all we do is we sort it and we return the number of items we're interested in. So when you actually look at it, that kind of complex notion of collaborative filtering and filling in missing matrix values is really just as simple as picking the top three users you're interested in, aggregating the way they've rated previous videos, and then returning the videos with the highest ratings. So there are actually a couple of problems with collaborative filtering that I have to let you know about. Uh, the most common is the cold start problem, right? So if your whole thing of providing recommendations is based on having previous data about like user one liking a video and user two liking a different video, if you don't have any ratings for any users, it'll be really hard to power recommendations. Because right, you simply don't have enough data, which is why it's considered the cold start problem. The other problem you'll have is uh, data sparsity. Right? So if you have a pretty small data set, like most Rails apps, it's probably not going to be too much of a problem. But if you start to get into very, very large data sets, or even just medium-sized data sets, where you have, like, say, a million users and uh, a 1,000 different products, that matrix is going to get very, very big. And most users aren't going to have rated most of the items you have in your catalog, which means all of a sudden the vast majority of your the vast majority of your items don't have ratings. Now, this can be worked around using a couple of advanced techniques, but it's something you definitely need to know about because a lot of these machine learning libraries that you'll just plug into your Rails apps won't handle this. So if you have very sparse data, it can become a problem. The other problem, of course, with it being memory-based, it's very, very resource expensive. Right? So as you can see, we're basically pulling in the entire matrix into memory and then iterating over it. Right? And we were iterating over it a couple of times. Right? So that actually becomes pretty expensive, as I said, if the matrix becomes quite large. So if you have that million users, you're going to be iterating a million times, and then a million times again, and you're holding that entire thing in memory. So if it's expensive, you're probably wondering, well, doesn't the actual content of the video matter for recommendations? Right? Like Clearly, there must be some importance. And that's kind of where we get to with content-based recommendations. So content-based recommendations say, rather than, let's looking, rather than looking at previous behavior of users, let's actually just look at the pure content of the thing we're looking to recommend. Right? So really what you're doing is you're just classifying items based on features that describe that item. So like, let's say, video duration or video category. And then we're just going to pick other items that fall in the same category or class as the item we're looking to recommend. And it turns out this is actually pretty easy. Tons of people have published tons of gems on how to do classification, and there's tons of algorithms you can choose from. Right? I listed some of the most common ones there. We have k-means clustering, random forest, support vector machines. But you can pretty much insert your favorite machine learning algorithm for classification and just see how it works. 
So let's look at an example. So if we have those same five videos from before, we now actually have information or features that describe those videos. For instance, type of content, duration, and maturity. And what we're going to do is we're going to classify those videos using k-means clustering. K-means clustering is just a way of grouping items into k different distinct clusters. And then what we do is we just assign new items to a cluster, and then we pick items that are already in that cluster as our recommendations. Again, this complex problem actually becomes pretty simple when we pull it into Ruby code. Right? So the first, first part of this script is just, again, turning the uh, features into code that Ruby can use. And then what we'll see is I've used a couple of functions here so that we don't have to get into the dirty details. But basically, first thing you have to do is just normalize your videos. So you have to make sure that like comedy, action, romantic, and sports can turn into some integer that an algorithm will know how to calculate. And then wh what we're going to do is we're going to train our k-means classifier. So with all the videos that we're not interested in providing a recommendation for, we're going to stick them in our k-means algorithm, and we're going to let it determine clusters. Right? We're going to say, OK, you're going to put video 1 and video 2 in cluster A. You're going to put video 4, video 5 in cluster B. Right? And now we're actually interested in providing our recommendation. So we've done that training. We've done that clustering ahead of time. And now when new users come in and they say, OK, what video should I watch? Right? I just finished watching video 4. What video do you recommend for me? Well, now all we have to do is we just have to put that video 4 into our trained classifier, say, what cluster are you in? It pops up and says, OK, you're in cluster A. Sweet. That's easy. That means we just return all the videos that are in that cluster, and they're probably going to be reasonable candidates for a recommendation. So there are a couple of problems with content-based recommendations as well that you need to be aware of. Uh, the first one is that unsupervised learning is a pretty hard problem in machine learning. Uh, if you don't have pre-categorized data, like if you can't say that video A falls into the category of, uh, let's say, good for children, it can be very hard to infer that. The other thing is that training data tends to be pretty limited. So it can actually be very hard to have a nice training data set that's already pre-classified that you can train these algorithms on. And it tends to be pretty expensive if you want to go out and get it, right? So to get videos pre-classified, you'd have to spend tons of money on humans going through and categorizing all these videos for you. The other problem is it doesn't take users into account, right? Like, clearly, there's some importance in recommendations for users who are similar to myself, right? I don't just want to see content that is exactly the same as what I just watched. Sometimes I want your system to recommend new novel content that I might not have been able to discover on my own. And there also can sometimes be limited features for the types of content that you have. So if you have videos, it can be very hard to pull out features that you can machine learn on. So it turns out there's kind of a way to solve this problem, and that's with hybrid recommendations. And hybrid recommendations are a way of combining the best of both worlds. So you take collaborative filtering, and you take content-based recommendations, and you combine them in such a way that you get better performance than you would with any individual approach. So here's a diagram that, it, that kind of explains hybrid recommendations. Right? You have your input, which would be the user on your page who just finished watching a video. And what you do is you put that through your collaborative filtering-based recommender, and at the same time, you also put it through your content-based recommender. And then they're both going to output some recommendations. And then we're going to put it into a combiner. The combiner can be whatever you want. It can say, OK, always take the top two from collaborative filtering, and then take the bottom three from content. It can say, always take collaborative filtering, unless there isn't five, in which case you take content. And then it's going to output the recommendations. So again, this diagram can be simplified into just a couple lines of Ruby code. Right? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying best recommendations should be the intersection of my recommendations from collaborative filtering and my recommendations from content. Right? And if I don't have enough of these best recommendations just from the intersection, then I'm just going to return the recommendations from my collaborative filtering, because I believe collaborative filtering is, is better in this situation. That's one way to do it. The other way you can combine things is you can actually have them feed into each other. Right? So in this case, your input goes directly into your content-based recommendation, and that might start to do that clustering ahead of time. And once you have those clusters, you then put the cluster data into your collaborative filtering recommender. Now what this does is it helps reduce that data sparsity problem. Right? Rather than having tons of videos, what I do is I group the videos into categories. Right? This is action-adventure. This is comedy. 
and then I feed that into my user-based collaborative filtering. So now rather than it being user one, video one, video two, video three, it's just user one, action adventure, user one, comedy. And the final way you can combine them, this is a little bit more cutting edge. There's actually some work in physically embedding content-based recommendations into the algorithm you use for collaborative filtering. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because it's bleeding edge, but if you're interested in this stuff, you should definitely go and look. Uh, this is actually what ended up helping win the Netflix prize. They used a really complex matrix reduction technique that uh, is described in this slide. So now that we've talked about how we build them and the different algorithms you have to choose from, the question is how do we evaluate the quality of a recommendation so that we can decide if we want to pick algorithm A or algorithm B. Now there are a couple ways you can do that. Uh, the first one is called pre precision versus recall. This is the way that most books will describe uh, two different algorithms, and it's the way most academic papers will describe them. It's kind of considered the more mathematical way of evaluating recommendations. Uh, in addition to that, though, I think if you're trying to run these things in production, what you really care about is how your users respond to your recommendations, right? And the way you gain, like, gauge those metrics is through clicks and click-through rate. So, right, if I roll out a new recommendation algorithm and all of a sudden my click-through rate, go, click rate goes way down, it doesn't matter what precision and recall means because my users aren't responding. And then the final and best way, if you can, is to get direct user feedback. So if you have that like thumbs up, thumbs down on the recommendation section, that can be really useful because the user will directly tell you, hey, I don't actually like this movie that you've recommended for me, you need to fix something. So since it's the most common, I'll just go into precision versus recall a little bit, just so you have a little bit of an understanding of what it means. So precision is basically your ability to pull out recommendations from all the items in a, in a test set divided by the total number of recommendations you've put forth, right? So let's say you have a test set of uh, 10 videos that the user went on to watch. You'd, uh, you'd put one video into your recommender and it would recommend three videos. And you'd say, okay, what's the intersection between the videos I recommended and all of the videos that the user went on to watch? And then recall is kind of the other side of that. It's saying basically like, what was my ability to recall things from the actual training set itself? So let's look at the Ruby code for that. Again, it's actually pretty simple, right? Like, let's say our test set is video one, video two. What we would do is we'd just say, call your recommender, pull out those recommendations, and then it's just some simple math, right? We just do a simple uh, intersection between the recommendations and the test set, and then we divide by the recommendation length, and then in recall, we do recommendations and test set, and then we divide by the test set length. So really this whole thing is, is, it ends up being very simple if you pull it down into the most basic components. So to summarize what we've learned so far, we've seen that collaborative filtering uses similar users to, be, to uh, provide recommendations. We've also seen that you can use content-based algorithms such as clustering using k-means to provide recommendations. We've also seen that you can combine these two algorithms together to further boost quality, so you end up with recommendations that are superior to anything that you get individually. And then finally, we looked at ways you can evaluate your recommender using things such as precision versus recall and click-through rates. Now, I've showed you a little bit of kind of what goes on behind the scenes, but that doesn't mean you need to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of existing libraries that can provide good recommendations for you kind of out of the box, so you don't have to write a ton of Ruby boilerplate code yourself, right? Probably the most well-known of those is a project, Apache project called Apache Mahout. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. It has a robust recommender built in, and it also runs on top of the Hadoop framework. So if you do have a big data problem, uh, you're, you can still run these algorithms on, uh, on Hadoop. Now, if you're in the Ruby community, clearly you don't want to use raw Mahout because that's Java, and nobody wants to write Java. But it turns out some Ruby developers have written a nice wrapper around uh, Apache Mahout called JRuby Mahout. There was a couple of good uh, blog posts that described it. So you can just do that. At the same time, most of these algorithms come down to basic matrix operations, which means you should definitely check out the SciRuby project. Right? I know in one of the previous talks, uh, they said that the Ruby community is not as mature as the Python community when it comes to scientific computing. And that might be true, but the CyRuby guys are making big steps towards making it better. And if you want to be able to build any sort of recommendation stuff in Ruby, you're going to want to check out this project. 
And then finally, I would also check out the Recommender Lab project for R. So this is not Ruby specific, obviously, R is a different language. But if you're trying to like, benchmark different algorithms and you just want to see like, what are the best possible recommendations I could get for the data I have, it's probably the best way to do that quickly and iteratively, because that's what it was built for. And uh, here I just want to throw up a couple of uh, resources and kind of further, further readings. Uh, I think the first one is a, is a textbook. I would definitely check it out if you're interested in this stuff. It provides a nice overview. It's not language specific. It covers a little bit more of the math. But it's, uh, it's a nice way to get you started, and it points at a ton of academic papers. And then the other uh, things I've listed there are also just kind of the most well-known academic papers uh, that kind of really set the bar for recommendations. I'll post my slides with links so you don't have to like try and copy these things down and find them yourself. And that concludes the actual uh, slide portion of my talk. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions if people had questions. So uh, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Oh yeah, so his question was, uh, what's the state of the art for providing recommendations based on like, the state that the user's in, or the time of day, or some sort of other metadata? So it ends up being kind of two parts. The, the time-sensitive component, there's uh, more advanced collaborative filtering techniques that rather than just doing those like, pure loops over everything that I showed, they'll use uh, weighting schemas. So rather than just doing pure Pearson's correlation coefficients, like video one, video two, uh, they'll actually include time in that, right? So if you watch a video one five minutes ago, that will be much more heavily weighted than, uh, say, another video that you watched uh, three days ago. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of work going on in that. And then the uh, kind of user emotion side, actually, basically it ends up being a hybrid approach. So really what you try and do is you first try and just classify the user's like, um, mood or emotion based on their browsing behavior. And once you've kind of classified that or grouped that, you would just do the collaborative filtering based on that, right? So then really what you're doing is just saying, OK, like a user who was uh, in mood A uh, went on to watch video B, so you'll recommend that. So considering the case of like an Amazon book uh, recommender, it seems that popularity of a book, it would be a key feature. But at the same time, it's sort of transient depending how long the book is. You know, the data changes over time based on how long the book's been out and how do you compare that. Do you, have you, you have any advice on how you factor in a feature of the popularity of an item? Yeah, so I think, uh, actually, the surprising thing is a lot of times, uh, you actually don't have to worry about it. So it sounds kind of funny, but a lot of times just the pure collaborative filtering-based approach will actually perform better than kind of trying to over-feature engineer mm -hmm. things that you think will be popular. So like Amazon's first published version of their algorithm was just pure item-item-based collaborative filtering. They actually like, didn't take anything into account of like, pure like, popularity or spiky popularity. It was just the overall weighting. Uh, one thing you can do is uh, all that stuff uh, is based on those numbers, right? And those are like rankings. So what you can do if you want is you can have that rank be determined by the popularity of an item. So uh, the mo most po like, common example of that is actually uh, search terms, right? So like Google will determine the rank of a search term by how many times it's appeared in a given period of time. So that's one way you can take that into account. Can you comment on any overlap between the problem of recommendations and the problem of record linkage and uh, identifying um, different data? Of rec uh, uh, common identities between different um, uh, records and different data sets? I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean. You're talking about like how, how can you use recommendations to join them? or like the problems you have when you have the like disparate data sets that you're trying to like pull together? Right, no, uh, so, so record linkage, let's say you've got two different data sets, uh, the problem is to figure out um, which of those uh, records describe actually the same entity. Mm. Okay, yeah, um, that I think actually ends up being more of a classification problem than a recommendation problem per se. Um, so, it basically would come down to that kind of more like content-based recommendation stuff, right, which really falls under the category of classification because there's kind of those two, I mean, machine learning has a ton of subdivisions, but at a high level, the way I think about it is there's kind of like recommendation problems and like classification problems. Classification problems is the stuff like, yeah, like do these two things describe the same entity? Like uh, is this tweet a positive or negative sentiment? Like that kind of stuff. 
So yeah, that, that would definitely fall in that category. Um, there's a lot of good, actually, uh, you should check out the blog post by Elir Gregoric. He does a, a couple of good blog posts on doing classification in Ruby that would probably be useful. Uh, he does one on using libsvm, and he does another one on using, uh, on using uh, random forests, or perhaps just trees, decision trees. But yeah, definitely check those out. Recommendations. Is there a point where you won't get better recommendations despite having more and more features for the techniques? Yeah, you definitely reach that point with a single algorithm actually pretty quickly. Uh, that's why right now, really, most of the systems that the really big companies are using are all those hybrid approaches or ensemble methods. Because, yeah, you end up like maxing out one algorithm. So you really see those boosts when you find new ways to combine things, which is kind of, yeah. The, so the Netflix prize actually ended up being like an ensemble of, I think it was like 50 plus different individual algorithms to, to get the boost that they ended up reporting. I learned from this talk earlier today that Python has math built right into the language, and I'm wondering, why aren't you using Python? Why are you using Ruby? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a good question. Uh, mostly because we're, uh, we're a Ruby shop. Uh, actually, we're, so to be completely honest, it's not exclusively Ruby. So uh, some of the modeling we do is actually in Java and Scala as well. But I just find like Ruby's a very good tool to kind of teach people the basic algorithms. And if you're just running a kind of regular app that you just want to add recommendations to to boost endorsement, you're not going to need the mathematical capabilities that Python's going to give you. Because, I mean, as we can see, like most recommendation stuff actually ends up being really, really simple until you have like matrices that are like hundreds of thousands or millions of like rows wide. Like then you need Python, maybe. But I don't know. At that point, you probably need C or Java. So psh, you don't need Python. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks. Every oh, wait, no, might be. Huh?